Hi, everyone, and welcome to the podcast. Today, I'm talking with Isaac Morehouse. He's the founder and CEO of Crash and the founder of Praxis. He's written over 10 books, and Isaac is the host of the Isaac Morehouse podcast. His most recent book is The Inner Game of Startups, which I have here. It's a very exclusive book, only available on the Bitcoin blockchain, so I'm happy to have that. But Isaac, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to come on the podcast with me. Hey man, appreciate uh, appreciate you bringing me on. It's been uh, it's been fun to see some of your stuff um, over the last several months, especially that you're putting out there, getting your podcast going. A lot of your other content is really really top notch. Yeah, well, thanks. So Isaac, I wanted to hear some of the listeners probably haven't heard about Praxis or Crash, uh, but they're two companies that I am really I really love. I follow all the uh, everyday stuff that they that you guys put out on your Twitter feed. Um, tell me a little bit about the germ of that idea for both Praxis and Crash because they're kind of related. Yeah, definitely. It's it's all kind of part of the same thread. Um, I mean, the real germ of the idea starts when I was in college, um, and I just I felt like it was a huge waste of time and money, and I couldn't really figure out why is everybody telling me I have to do this? Why do people claim that you can't get a job without a college degree? Is that really true? You know, I go on the job market and like, yeah, my degree is listed on my resume. And yes, jobs say degree required, but nobody ever checked or asked or cared. That didn't seem to be at all relevant. And so, you know, from that point, I was really frustrated. I thought this is just such a huge waste. It's so divorced from the real world. It has really nothing to do with career success in any way. Um, it's just like college is just this totally separate thing. And there's you know, there's interesting, like I had a couple classes that I liked. I really like philosophy and economics. I did a lot of study on my own, but, um, so, so it's not like the idea of like the idea of like having somebody who studied something, you know, teach a class on it is a bad idea. I'm not saying that at all, but the way that college is put together, it's just like, it's a joke, frankly. And it has, and especially when it comes to the career component, like that component of the college bundle, the, the idea that that's supposed to help make you more valuable creator in the, in the real world economy. Um, is absolutely absurd. And I would argue in, in pretty much every field, even the fields where it's legally required and even the fields where people say, well, it's really good for the hard sciences or medicine or whatever. I, I actually disagree there as well. I think that it is making people worse practitioners. Um, absolutely. Like I take somebody who, you know, apprenticed uh, in any kind of medical thing for years than somebody who did, went to med school or whatever. Like, I, But that's a separate point. For the majority of people... They're going into very generic things anyway. They're, they're in terms of their degrees. It's like communications, business, and it just has no connection to anything. So I had this irritation. I had sort of ideas. I mean, I was very young at the time, like, okay, what would be a better version of, you know, transitioning into a professional world, getting sort of a career job? And I didn't really know where to go with it. So fast forward a decade later, I'd been sort of just going through my own career, doing, you know, pursuing what was interesting to me. And I got the idea for Praxis, which was essentially, hey, what if we could, what if we could give people the basic training that they need to, to, to go from right out of high school to understanding enough about the professional world to be able to add some value from day one, right? Not, not, not anything insane, but to come in as a young person who at least you know how to use Google Calendar and spreadsheets and you know the basics, um, and you can come in and create value if, if employers – if you can come in and say, hey, I'll be an apprentice and it's going to be very low cost for you. I'm an apprentice for six months. And if at the end of that six months I've proven valuable, I can get hired on full time. That was kind of the idea. And, um, you know, put it together, uh, kind of like went all in, quit my job, just built this thing, you know, sort of from scratch. It was really hard at first to get people to, to be willing. This is 2013 when we launched it. Um, but not long after that, the narrative started to Peter Thiel launched his Thiel Fellowship where, you know, he'll pay you to drop out of school. There started to be more of a narrative around alternatives to college in terms of getting your career started. Um, you know, in these days, it's not nearly as radical as it was then to, to kind of have the message. So, you know, we got that going and um, just have had a ton of success with, you know, hundreds of hundreds of people who have gone through it. And, um, you know, they do the boot camp. They're placed in the apprenticeship. They earn in the apprenticeship uh, more than what they pay in tuition. So the program, a year-long program, is a net cost of zero. It's actually a positive um, for the participants. And there's a 95% uh, 
employment rate immediately upon graduation of the program, right? Colleges will tell you, oh, here's our graduate employment rate. You know, it's like 48%. And that's, and that's in like a 90 or 120 day window after graduation. So with Praxis, we're talking the day of graduation, you already have a full-time job. 90, 93%, I think, um, of participants, right? Like it's, it's incredible. Um, so after building that up, you know, for several years and getting it to be a, a you know, a really well-oiled machine and, you know, um, working very well, profitable, I was like, what could we take a part of this? Just, just the component where students are winning those jobs. And we're talking about Praxis participants are 18, 19, 20. They're getting hired at jobs that say four-year degree required plus two to three years of experience. They have neither of those, and they're getting those jobs over candidates who have those by creating pitches, by putting together a little pitch decks or a little video, making a project for the company, emailing it to the hiring manager directly. Hey, Aaron, I love what your company's doing. I've been following you guys. I went ahead and made this landing page for you and put together this FAQ because I noticed people on Facebook asking questions about it. I didn't see one on your website. Check it out. I would love to come and work for you. That email, it's like insane how effective that, and then nobody cares. Nobody asks about your degree anymore. Nobody cares about it. They're like, whoa, this is different. This is interesting. I want to talk to this person. So we were helping people get hired through that process with Praxis, and I thought, could we create a vastly larger in scale, a platform to help people do that, to help millions of people on the job hunt to essentially pitch themselves instead of just click apply with resumes on job boards. And so we raised some venture capital, launch crash um crash.co about three years ago and you know the core of it is a video pitch tool we've had several different iterations of the product but that's always been at the core of it is be your own credential we like to say like burn your resume be your own credential like don't tell people don't give them bullet points of your static credentials and accomplishments whatever show them something that tangibly demonstrates why they would want to talk to you why they would want to hire you like make them get excited and it doesn't have to be that big. It can be a little project it can be a little video. It can be like, it's amazing how low the bar is to stand out. Um, and so we kind of built the platform to enable that. And, um, you know, I've found along the way that the biggest hurdle is really mental. Like you can create all the tools and make it really easy to create a great video pitch, but the vast majority of job seekers are going to, they're, they're, they're going to do what they have been instructed to do. You get the grades, you do the things, you check the box, you format the resume, you send it out. And to break that mindset and to get people thinking more like they are autonomous, they're in the driver's seat of their job hunt, of their life, of their career, that pitching themselves, hey, you think that company's cool and you like their product? Why don't you pitch them on working there? People don't think that way. They don't think that way. They're like, well, I got to go to a jobs board. I got to look at the jobs. I got to look at titles that sound similar to my degree. And then I got to like put in the resume that the career center told me to use a template or whatever. I Googled a template, I click submit, and then I just <laughs> the best and it's all in the hands of some HR bureaucrat, right? They don't think, man, Spotify is my absolute favorite app. Maybe I should pitch them on hiring me. I'm really good at making videos. What if I made a mashup video of like my favorite Spotify playlists and I, and I Googled around and I found who is the, who's the marketing director at Spotify or who's the content guy, whatever. I do a little sleuthing. I put together a little video and I say, Hey, I made this for you. I want to come. I want to do a, I want to work for you for free for a month and let's see if I can do anything for Spotify. Nobody thinks that way. So to get people to use the tools, we first realized the mindset barrier is huge. And so we kind of put a huge emphasis on content and we kept stripping it down smaller and smaller. Okay. We have this really in-depth course, which is amazing. You can go through it. The, cra the career crash course, the, the job hunting crash course, kind of walking you through everything step by step, but it's a, but it's a pretty big thing. And then we kind of like, okay, well we have career guides, which are like longer PDFs. We have blog posts and we have podcasts. And it was like, we need to make this even smaller. It's too much for people. So we stripped it down to the daily job hunt, a free email every day. It's really short and it just hits your inbox. And we're just giving you little bits of this mindset, like just slowly introducing you to the possibility that maybe if you've applied a hundred times and never heard back, 
maybe you could think about something different. And here's an example of what that might look like. And just really slowly trying to change the mind frame. And that's kind of where we're at now. And the Daily Job Hunt has been very successful. We have over 150,000 uh, subscribers. You can go subscribe for free at, at Crash.co. Um, and then kind of utilizing that to sort of feed people into to understanding and using some of the tools that we've built um, to go pitch themselves and win jobs. So rambled for a long time. But there's the that's kind of catches <laughs> us up to where we are. Yeah, Isaac, I love that. And I, that that mindset shift that you talked about is so important because I, I had been following Crash for a couple of years, following your po- guys' podcast, and I kept thinking to myself, how can I do something different? I, I, I love this company. And then finally I thought, wait a minute, I, maybe I could uh, pitch Isaac himself. So I made a, I made a little video for Isaac uh, uh, and gave him a pitch, which you can find on my blog. I'll put a, a link to that blog post up there, but, you know, and then we we ended up working together on a few things, but that mindset set shift is so crucial because then I started thinking, okay, well, what else can I do? Well, maybe there's other companies I can work part time for in in the evenings and weekends and, and create value for them. Maybe I could restart my my blog and podcast and, and start putting out more value on that. Like for example, I'm I'm putting out some books that I've written for free on my blog so that people I'm starting to build a brand, uh, putting putting stuff out there more. It, and it's just like a, you get the ball rolling and you just start thinking, okay, what can I do next? What can I do next? How can I create more value? And that mindset shift, oh, it's so important. Who's ever writing the uh, the daily job hunt emails is really good. They, they're they short, like a paragraph or two with some good links at the end as far as resources that you can use. But uh, is that you writing them or is that Joel? So it started as me and Joel has taken it over and he's been writing it for a long time now for the vast majority of the um, J. Lee job has been around for 10 months, I think. Um, and it's it's almost all Joel. I mean, we we have a, a vast catalog of hundreds of blog posts and guides and podcasts and whatever with kind of a lot of different content out there that he's drawing from, you know, because he's so immersed in all this stuff too. It's like once you get it, I mean, you know this, once you sort of like have the like, the light bulb moment and you like understand the mindset and some of the ways of approaching things like job hunting and just your career in general, then it's sort of like it's there. And Joel is just phenomenal. I mean, he writes those, um, he writes those in every day and gets them out there. They're, they're absolutely, they're absolutely awesome. So, and, and there, man, I gotta give you a shout out. Cause like it is amazing to see you got on the platform and I saw you, you know, hopping around in the Slack group and asking questions and stuff. And then you sent me this pitch and I sent it to the team and I was like, oh my gosh. I was like, we're not hiring right now, but like, I have to talk to this guy. Cause like he gets it, he gets it. And this is what we see by the way. Like when we look at our activation data and stuff, so many people get on there and they like create a, they go to create a pitch and then they like plug in a few things, but they never make the video or do anything. And then that's it. And they abandon it. And that's that's like the very common behavior. Or else maybe they'll come back three months later or six months later and be like, okay, I was going to make this pitch, but instead I kept sending my resume and I sent it another 200 times and I got nothing. So now I'm finally ready. I'll put in a little work. And it, do- and it doesn't have to be that much work. I mean, you can put in a ton of work if you want to, and sometimes that pays off. But even just a basic you know, pitch emailed directly to five hiring managers, you're going to get at least one of them to respond. I mean, the the response rate is like 80%, but you're probably going to get the interview rate is like one out of three, right? So, um, but anyway, once, once you have sent one pitch, people who have sent one pitch, they average like four pitches, right? Because it's like, it, you feel it, you feel the difference in, oh, I get it. I, this is kind of fun. I like think of what's a little project. What's a what's a thing I could send? How could I pitch this person? And and even if you don't get the job, you feel like you're in control. You're proud of what you made. It was kind of a fun process, right? You and it's like it gets something going. It it unlocks a different aspect of you, um, which is amazing. So anyway, your your pitch, you sent us this absolutely killer pitch. Um, with a hilarious, uh, adorable video with your kids in it. You gave us you gave us feedback on ways that you think we could improve some things, but not in a way that was like arrogant and pretending that you know how to run the company, just like helpful. Hey, I'm a user. I love using your product. This would make it easier for me as a user. So instead of just telling you, I went ahead and did it. I went ahead and made this responsive website for your career guide. Like really, really powerful. I had to talk to you. And again, as I said, we're not hiring right now, but I, I was like, all right, let's do a project. Come on and do some projects for us. 
um, you know, you made us a great promo video. You gave us some feedback on the site, and we made some immediate changes. But prim- we're, we're doing some we're doing some major overhaul stuff on the site down the road, and your feedback is a big part of that, right? Because like, hey, we're two in the weeds. Users coming and sharing this stuff, this matters. So anyway, even though we couldn't hire you, you did a project for us, and now if you want any job anywhere, I know. I will vouch for you. I will go out there and I'll, if a job comes across my desk that I think would be a good opportunity for you, I'll pass it along, right? Like you've got an advocate now. You've got somebody because you impressed me. So that's why I tell people, even if the company you pitch isn't hiring, if you send them a great pitch like that, you know, maybe that you do a project with them, whatever, it's like you are building, you are increasing your luck surface dramatically, right? I didn't know who you were before this. I'd interacted yeah. with you online, but I didn't know you personally. Now I do. Now you're in my mental Rolodex when certain things come across my table. And, and if you come to me and say, hey, will you give me a reach out to this person? Hey, do you know this person? You know, I saw that you're an investor who invested in your company, invested in their company. Do you know the CEO? I'm applying there. Can you get me an in? Like that's how that's how it works, right? And, and it starts by just putting yourself out there. So shout out to you um, for doing that and really embodying what we're, what we're all about. Well, well thanks. Thanks for that. You know, I'm wondering, I, I almost didn't send a pitch to you. And, and like you said, once you do one, you, you start thinking of more ways to do others. But, you know, just getting that mindset that just, hey, experiment, try things. I think that's that's a big part of it. Is there ever a time where putting something out there like a video or your resume online with all these different projects and things, is there ever a time where that could be a liability? Like if you're literally just not that good, if your pitch sucks is there a possibility that it could hamper you in any way? I mean, look, it's possible. We always got to ask compared to what. So, you know, let's say you you have a, a video pitch that sucks and you put it out there. Okay. How is that going to hurt you compared to not putting anything out there at all? Right. Now, I mean, it may, but most yeah. people who have that worry – Putting something not very great out there would be no worse. In fact, it'd probably be better than not having anything at all, right? Like, I mean, if you just apply with your typical resume, um, I can't tell you apart from anybody else. I Google you. I can't find anything. Uh, If I find a video where you where you pitched, you know, and these pitches don't have to be public, by the way, like you can keep, you can just email them to the hiring manager and not share them beyond that. But but let's say they are public. I find a video where you pitched. You know, Apple on coming and working for them, and it has one view, and it's a really crappy video. I, I'm still going to be like, well, that's kind of interesting. That shows some gumption. Like they missed the mark, but hey, they got some swagger, right? Like that's not that's not really going to bother me for the most part. I mean, look, you can put stuff online that will hurt your reputation for sure, right? I mean, if you have a bunch of crazy stuff, like you, usually, it's when you are thinking of your online presence as a consumer that you tend to do the most damage because you're like consuming videos and then raging in the comments, right? You're just kind of indulging. You're just doing it as like a a fun thing when you're doing it in any kind of concerted way to like, Hey, I want to pitch an opportunity. I want to experiment. I want to design a landing page and tell people about it. That kind of stuff. I, I cannot think of examples where I think that's hurt somebody's reputation or ability to get a job, right? It's more like, I can't control myself from raging about political debates on Twitter uh, or Facebook. Um, That might hurt you because people don't want to work with a psycho or somebody who's, you know, got crazy beliefs or whatever. Right. So like, um, but, but I think the main thing here, there's like sort of a broader point behind your question. I think the main thing is being, being at unity uh, being at one with yourself, that sounds really, that sounds woo woo, but here, here, here's what I mean. Like people feel like on the job hunt, they have to pretend to be someone that they're not. And that's kind of how you're coached and trained, right? Like make your resume, make you look better than you really are. That's kind of the idea. You, you, you puff up the words, you know, oh, I was a sanitary engineer, you know, no, you were a garbage person, right? Like, that's the whole idea of, like, the whole game with resumes and stuff, trying, trying to, like, trick people into thinking that you are beyond, and, and that's sort of like a lot of what people think of social media as, trying to, like, portray this image. 
that will only make you stressed and uncomfortable. And if you get the interview and what people experience in the interview is different from what you projected, that's going to hurt you in the long term, right? Being honest about who you are is not the opposite of selling yourself and selling your skills, right? And selling and pitching yourself is not the same as exaggerating and lying about yourself. You got to get that out of your head. Like a good salesperson never lies. A good salesperson is empathetic, not sociopathic, right? A good salesperson understands who are they talking to? What do they value? What are they interested in? They're genuinely interested in you. They're asking questions about you. They're curious about you. And if they identify something where something they offer that they genuinely can, can deliver on actually would be valued by you, even if you don't know it, they try to help you see that. That's it, right? And so like, when you think about companies, you think about them. If you make it about them, hey, I'm interested in you. I think you're really cool. I made this project for you, for your company, because I love the mission. It's really hard to be embarrassed in that way. It's really hard to have anything, right? Because you're, and you're, and, and you're being honest. You, can, you don't say, hey, I can come in and I can do blah, 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 if you don't have those skills. But you can win jobs, even if the job says that you need, I mean, I've had people do this before. You need a certain type of skill uh, that you don't have. I've seen people win that job by saying, I'm so in love with your mission, I'm so in love with your company, and I'm a fast learner and I'm super curious. Here's indications of that. I once wanted to learn this, so I read three books and wrote a blog post. I'm going to bring that same mentality to your job. I don't know this skill, but I'm going to learn it. I've never used Salesforce before or any CRM, but I already started taking free classes on it and I want to learn it. People will take that honesty and that eagerness and they'll say, okay, great, right? So that's where you don't ever want to put out stuff that's not true but you can still demonstrate what is true and say, look, I'm honest about what I don't have, but here's what I do have and why I think it could still be a fit. Like, I think, I think that's where you can relieve a lot of that tension is just like be who you are and focus on your strengths in an honest way. Um, and then you don't have to worry so much. So yeah, I know it's like sort of all rambly all over the place, but I think, um, if you're never, if you're never being phony, then you don't have to, all that stress, of what do I put out there? What do I allow people to see sort of goes away? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's been a lot of, it seems like more and more people are worried. Uh, at least people I've talked to, you you know, who's going to see what's on my Facebook. What, what if I posted something, uh, you know, related to COVID that that's not, doesn't go along with the norm. Then am I going to be penalized during an interview or have you posted anything on Twitter? I know you're pretty active on Twitter that, has stopped you from getting any connections that you were hoping to get? No, you know what? That's crazy. Um, I'm super radical in terms of like beliefs that I hold that I'm not shy about that are well outside of the sort of mainstream of beliefs. Like I disagree with every political party and every government policy because I think government itself is immoral. That's really radical, right? That's like, oh, you know, I, I think every single every single government action taken over COVID um, is awful, and none of them should have been taken, right? Like that's that's pretty radical stuff. Now, I have found that you can, you know, there are certain people in places that would probably never hire me, and I don't mind that because those are places that I wouldn't want to. Like, if you wouldn't hire me just because I have certain beliefs on things that are unrelated to the job, then I don't want to work in a place that's that's that hostile to me anyway, right? But I, I think it's not so much what you believe, it's, it's how you behave about it, right? If you're clearly like addicted to arguing with people on Twitter and you're insulting people and you're there's something there that people don't want to work with that's not just about what you happen to believe. Now, they, they may give a pass to people who are assholes on Twitter um, about things that they agree with, that they're comfortable with, um, but that's not the point. I think you can you can be honest and be who you are without just being like a rager or an asshole or, you know, like just clearly incapable of, of ignoring trolls or whatever. Um, so that's one thing. But the other thing is if you, again, like 
when I when I go pitch venture capitalist as I have many times in the past um, for for funding or try to recruit a really high level talent to come work for me or um, you know anything a- anything in the business world try to try to land customers I'm focused on them and their needs and my vision and how those things can align and they either like it or they don't. And if they really like it, if I do my job well, and then they go on Twitter and they see that I also am like not a fan of the Federal Reserve or whatever, right? Um, yeah. I haven't had a case where someone's like, well, you really won me over with your vision, but then I realized you have like different political beliefs. Now, I have had, I have had cases where people have been <laughs> like, hey, I really like your vision, but I think you should make your company focused on getting government contracts. And I've said, no, I will never hmm. run a company that relies on government contracts because I would hate I would hate that life. And they've said, well, then I don't want to invest in you because it doesn't seem like you, you care about winning, you care about your beliefs. And I'm like, well, if that's fine, right? Um, there's, there's certain things that I just don't want to do, I don't mm-hmm. want to compromise on, right? So there's a cost, but, it, but the cost doesn't come in the form of, I mean, I'm out there saying drop out of college. I'm out there saying like, like public schools don't even need to exist, right? Now I don't make that my I don't yeah. make that my entire identity, because um, I care about who, who's my customer and what do I, what am I focused on there. But I th- my point is I think you can, and the further you go in your career and the more valuable you become, the more theoretically the more freedom you have to express yourself. What typically happens is the further you go in your career, if you have been sort of hiding your beliefs, then you keep hiding them because now the cost of revealing them gets higher and higher. So that's why it's like, be, be honest all the way, but in a polite way, like, you know, I go to people's blogs who I've hired and I read, they've got blog posts and they have radically different policy positions than me. I mean, I've hired people who are more or less socialists in terms of the policies they would like to see in this country. I haven't had a I haven't had a problem with that. If they were good employees and they did their job well, that's what I that's what I care about, right? Like that's fine. Um, I'm not I'm not going to bother about that. Now, if they're if they're always attacking people on social media or something like that, and they're just like unhinged, then no, I, I don't want to hire that person, right? But it's not so much about the belief. So, yeah, I think it's just like uh, uh, here's like a great heuristic. If you ever click post or send or whatever on something that's going online or in an email and you walk away and what you just sent stays with you. You keep thinking about it. You keep being irritated about it. You keep wondering if someone responded and you come back and somebody did respond and then you can't rest until you respond to them. That's a sign that that's probably something you shouldn't have posted. Because what, not because it's immoral or wrong or factually incorrect, but because it's making you not at peace with yourself. Now, I've had this many, many times where I've posted something and then it's like it stays in my mind for the rest of the day and not in a way that's making me happy. And I'm like, hmm, I shouldn't have posted that if that's what it's going to do. I don't want to carry that around with me. And that's a good sign that like you're, you're, you're getting out ahead, you know, in front of your skis a little too much. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one thing that both Crash and Praxis focus on a lot is this idea of learning out loud. And I'm wondering if you use that same concept as you homeschool your kids, because I know you have, I think, is it five kids? Four kids. Four or five kids. Okay. Do you, and how do you use that concept when as you're homeschooling, or, or do you? Or how, much, how much of the ideas from Praxis and Crash transfer over to homeschooling? Yeah, I try. Uh, my <laughs> my kids kids will always keep me <laughs> humble. They can always sniff it. They'll be like, "Oh, it sounds like all your praxis stuff or all your crash stuff, whatever." Um, you know, they they like to. <laughs> they'll be like, "Oh, you're you sound like." I'll be like, "No, kids, what you should do is this." They'll be like, you, you, uh, "You're doing all this business talk now, Dad. Uh, go away." Um, but no, that is definitely a part of it. Like the idea of learning being confined to an enclosed room, like literally a cinder block cell in the case of schools and universities, right? That is literally detached from the commercial world by very, very long driveways, extensive campuses, and often barbed wire fencing and like IDs to be scanned. I mean, literally, it's like 
completely enclosed, completely detached from the world. You put yourself in a literal box with one person in front of it or whatever. And now here is where you do this thing called learning. And it's very private. And you, you turn in what you have learned to one person to tell you in private and then maybe share it with your parents whether you learned properly or not. That whole concept is like absurd. Can you imagine if companies yeah. and, and like people who are trying to innovate, you know, did things that way? Like, okay, everybody, you know, who's working on open source software or whatever, you all like go into little cells and you write your little code completely separate from everyone else and you give it to one person who tells you whether or not it's good and useful, whether it's correct. You right. know what I mean? It's like absurd. Learning yeah. does not happen that way. That's not how humans learn anything effectively except for the one thing they learn is how to live like slaves or obedient serfs. That's what you're learning. Not the yeah. content, not the subject matter. Whatever you may or may not retain about the subject matter is irrelevant. What you're learning is the conditioning of you're learning the idea that that is how learning works. That is how authority works. That is what your role is, is to do what you're told. And then when you're told you're expert enough, then you're allowed to do the next thing, which is crazy. So learning out loud is really just being human. I mean... It's like watch little kids who are haven't gone to school yet. How do they learn? They watch they watch their parents talk and then they then they just start babbling. They start trying to talk. If you've ever been to a foreign a foreign country before where you didn't speak the language and you're with a group of people, who's the person who picks up the language the quickest and ends up getting around and finding where the food is and all this stuff by communicating with the locals? It's not the person who studied the most. It's the person who is the least embarrassed to try talking to someone in a language that is not their own. Who's the least embarrassed to sound like a dumb gringo when they, you know, are like, ah, donde esta el baño, right? Like, you just try. <laughs> you just do it. You don't care. And then people will be gracious with you. They'll help you. And so, like, that's how kids naturally learn. So keeping that learning out loud thing alive is very important. And I think part of one of the reasons why we've, you know, homeschooled is not so much to, like, deliberately instill in you that you must learn out loud. It's more like to remove the artificial constraints that make you think that there's any other kind of learning that makes sense. Right. And so, yeah, we sort of like inculcate it, but it's more like just letting it happen, just letting it blossom, letting kids play and experiment and try stuff and ask questions and be curious and just do what they naturally want to do and trying to make a, a space for that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one area that uh, my daughter has been, learning out loud in is uh, there's a social network that we're both on called Twitch. And she saw your daughter post a, a beautiful painting that she did and sell it on there for some Bitcoin. And so she said, Hey, I want to do that too. So she's now making NFTs and selling them on Twitch for a few dollars. And she's just like the whole idea of uh, adding a, a monetary component to her artwork is just really invigorating for her. Um, but do you encourage your kids to to put stuff out there? Like, are they do they each have their own blogs and YouTube channels, or is it just kind of whatever uh, you know, whatever they're interested in? You know, I, sometimes I say to my kids, "Okay, don't just watch YouTube. Make a video too. You make a video of something." Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I've I've at various points I've done more pushing and prodding than others. Um, I try to sort of let it be mostly guided by their interests, but I will, I will encourage like, so with my daughter, she loves doing art and like, she doesn't know anything about NFTs and all this stuff. And like, you know, I think most NFTs are, are kind of silly, but the concept that, that your art can be more than something you just do for yourself, that people would actually pay you for it and that there's a value to it. And that in the digital world, all kinds of people will pay you for designs and stuff. That's something that's new to her. So I wanted to kind of introduce that to her. So instead of just telling her, I was like, I'm just going to take take this picture, picture she did, and I'm going to post it up there, and I'm going to say, hey, my daughter, here's this NFT. And then I'm going to show her, hey, look, people started buying this. She, You made, like, money. Look at your hand cash wallet. And she was like, oh, this is really interesting, right? And so letting her experience that. And when my son was younger, he was really into like food and he was like really like making all these different things and drinks and stuff. And so I had him, I had him like bartend when he was like 12 at a work party that we did. I know it's probably illegal. Um, cause he loved mixing, like he wasn't drinking alcohol. He loved like cocktails and like mixing flavors. I had him, he made sandwiches like deli sandwiches and he would bring them to, um, a different company's workplace at lunchtime and sell them. And you have people like 
pre-order and he would sell these, you know, sandwiches. He did that a couple times and he, he made a little money, but he realized since he was super into like, it needs to be really high quality meat and all this stuff. He realized without knowing the lingo that the margins weren't good enough, <laughs> that you can't sell a deli <laughs> sandwich for a high enough price to justify like boar's head salami and like, you know, fresh baguette and everything. Um, it's not worth all the time and the work. And like, so Yes, I have definitely encouraged my kids, um, you know, to 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 not just keep it to themselves, to to, to share those things, um, you know, to, to post things. But at the same time, they're they're in a culture that kind of values like constant sharing of like sort of cheap flim flam stuff. And I probably sound like kind of an old person saying this, and it, I'm not, not saying that's all bad, but like. Okay, let's just post some dance to TikTok. Let's just, which can be like oversharing, right? It's like, no, I don't want you, you know, I don't want little kids posting dance videos that everybody in the world can see and stuff like there's privacy concerns or whatever. But I do want you thinking about being creative, being creators. Like, um, you know, my son, my kids have never been super into video games, but uh, my son had a phase where he was really into Mario. And we have Mario Maker, which was awesome because then he could make levels and share them with others. So it was like the, the creative component, and that's what's cool about games like Minecraft. You know, there's a there's a creator component, not just a consumer component. So, um, so yes, a very long winded answer to your to your question. I try to do that. I could probably do it more, um, honestly, and that's something that's a struggle. Like as a, you know, you're working all day and you're creating a bunch of content and stuff yourself, and at the end of the day, you're just like, oh, I'm tired. I could I could try to do this. <laughs> YouTube thing with my kids or set up a podcast. So like pushing myself to do that more deliberately um, is something that I think I'd like to do more of. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I try, I try to get them to, to get them started and get the ball rolling and then kind of leave it in their hands. But it, it is a struggle. And that's one thing I wanted to ask you about is how do you divide up your time with everything you've got going on? You know, how do you know whether you're going to jump into a new project like you're doing with this tiny payment series or whether you should optimize your current stuff for, you know, every single different social media, uh, you know, each one has a, a different size image they should have. And, and, and should you write more blog posts or put out another podcast? There's so much that you could be doing, but how do you divide up your time personally and, and decide whether a project is worth pursuing? Yeah, that's that's a great question because I do I do a ton of stuff and I, I, I like to I like to build things, I like to create new things. Um, and so I've usually got a lot of different stuff. That's that's one of the I don't know if this is just wired into me or if it's more that I've learned it over the years. I know I have learned it over the years, but maybe I'm wired that way anyway. But I think that is one of the superpowers that I have or one of the strengths that I have that I've, I've realized it's, I can, I can manage a lot of different things more easily than, than some people. And the way that I've done that, I don't say that to brag at all. Like that's not like an amazing skill. I, I have very few, um, genuine skills. <laughs> Basically I talk and I write a lot <laughs> and, uh, and I figure out how to find really talented people who can actually do real stuff. Um, but I have kind of two, two, rules that help me one first and foremost is don't do stuff you hate so if i'm like promoting my companies or something and i'm like well i you know i got to promote it on linkedin and facebook and instagram and pinterest and all these channels we got to be on all of them if i hate being on those channels myself why why, why would i make myself go and, and be phony and go like you know, all right, well, we'll spin up a, you know, account on Instagram and pretend that we like doing it. And like, if it makes me hate <laughs> it, then it's, it's not going to be effective anyway. And what's the point? Like, why am I building a company anyway? Well, cause I want to have a, a better life and be fulfilled. And if, if I'm doing a bunch of stuff that I hate, like I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go to a podcast interview that I'm going to hate. Right. I said yes to this interview because I, I knew I would enjoy it. And that, that is something that I really try to stick with. I don't ever want to be stuck where I'm sitting in a meeting. And trust me, this has happened to me many, many times. So I've gotten pretty good at making it very, very rare. I don't ever want to be sitting in a meeting where I'm like, I hate this. I wish I wasn't here. 
like or dreading it. Oh my gosh, I have this meeting coming up. Ugh, it's like ruins my whole day. I wish I didn't have to do that. Or or an activity, right? Oh, I got to write this article that I don't want to write. Or whatever. I got to log into LinkedIn or Facebook and do a bunch of stuff that I hate doing in there. So I try to not do stuff that I hate and find stuff that is more enjoyable. Like, And I go through phases. Like Facebook was a huge marketing channel for Praxis early on. And that was primarily because I was very active on there. And I loved being active on there. And it was very valuable to me. That started to shift. It became less and less valuable and more and more annoying. And I suddenly realized I hate going on Facebook now. I'm just going to stop. I don't care. I don't care if it costs my – I had – you know, I had maxed out on whatever their limit is on friends on Facebook, and I had really high engagement, but I just started to hate being on there. And I was like, okay, I'm just not gonna, I'm not gonna do it. I enjoy Twitter right now. I'm sure at some point I'll start to hate Twitter. I don't know, but um, so I've just that that's one is is try as much as possible to eliminate things that I hate and focus on things that that actually b- return energy to me that are a net energy gain. Like when you're done with them, you feel better than when you started, right? Um, and I always feel that way when I write, by the way, always. When I'm done writing a blog post or anything, I click publish, I always feel energized and hyped up and I feel great. Like So that's why I know I gotta keep writing because I love writing, it makes me feel good. Podcasting is, is similar most of the time. Sometimes I can get tired, but. Um, and then the second rule is just basically the, the 80-20 rule. You know, the, like, and this is huge with business marketing, especially find a channel that just works really well and double down on that channel more and more and more and more until it stops returning additionally. And until that, until you've tapped out the most effective channel and you've gotten it and maximized its effectiveness, don't even worry about other channels. And I think I've done, I've made that mistake of being spread too thin. Okay. We got to be everywhere. We got to have a, you know, this and a this and a this and a profile on every social media account. And we got to be running ads here and we got to be doing this. We got to be, you know, oh, Clubhouse is here. It's a new thing. Everybody's on Clubhouse. Well, now I got to start doing Clubhouse meetings in addition to a podcast. And well, now everybody's moved over to TikTok. We got to be on TikTok. I, I've, I've learned that, like, you got to know yourself and your market, your audience. Like, ideally, you have to be a member of your target market because then, you, then knowing your market's easy. Um, and if you genuinely live where they live, then just keep living there and doing that and trying to go and like be everywhere at once usually does not pay off. You can, you can expand as you get success in a channel and go beyond that. But like, like for Praxis, for example, I love using Twitter personally and I use it all the time. Praxis gets very little traction from Twitter. Their target audience is largely not on Twitter. Facebook still works very well. So the company does a lot of activity on Facebook. Um, I don't. Crash, their customers are more on Twitter than they are on Facebook. Facebook doesn't do very much for Crash, right? But but Twitter does. Um, and so just figuring that out, like where do you get the maximum returns? And with Crash, we figured out, we tried SEO, driving people to our own site. We tried paid ads on this platform, all these different things. And we figured out that email is actually better than everything, like blows them all away, which we never would have expected it took us two years to figure this out. All the same content we've been putting out for years, we just packaged it up as an email, and it's gone crazy. It's gone way, way more traction than it did in any other channel. So it's like, okay, great. We're all in on email. I'm not worried about doing how many Twitter followers we have or any of that stuff. The email is the channel that's working. That's the channel we're going to put our focus in, like 80-20 rules. So those are kind of the two things that I, that I do. Like where am I going to get the most return, and where am I going to get, have the most fun and be the least bored, you know? Yeah. 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 You know, I mentioned, uh, the tiny payments series that you've been doing, which I've been really enjoying and you've got a spun up a sub stack over there where people can follow. I'll put it in the show notes, but it's basically, it seems like there's uh there's some genuine interest there, but there's some potential experimentation with maybe some business models you're interested in. Um, what's going on with tiny payments and why are you so interested in them now? Yeah, man, this is um, this is how it always works in my life. If you just keep pursuing things that are interesting to you, even if they all seem disconnected from each other, somehow they have a way of like coming together in weird ways. That was the that was Praxis's launch was this confluence of all these different things that seemed unrelated to each other that I had been doing and pursuing in my life, and they all melded. It was like, oh my gosh, all these things actually fit together. So I see something similar that's unfolding right now. So. 
what I've learned through Praxis and through Crash and through some other projects that I've been working on recently, um, I can't talk about yet, uh, is basically, and I've learned this the hard way, like with Crash, it was like, oh, we're going to build this product company. I learned the hard way, like, and that was a deviation from what I do well naturally. What I really do well is content and community. So I can, I can create a content around an idea, around a vision, around a brand, a, a concept, or, or try to shape a new category and rally people around that. And once you have that, you've created your own market, then rolling out products and services to them in, a, in an iterative fashion becomes easy because you've already got the market. Your go-to-market strategy is go to my market that I already own and say, hey, what if we uh, did this? Hey, what about this product, right? And so kind of learning this like community first, product second approach, which works really well for me because I'm, I'm – I am not a technical person myself. Um, and combining it with the learning out loud, just like don't keep it to yourself. If you're curious, like I'm curious about Bitcoin stuff, it has nothing to do with Crash or Praxis, has never benefited those companies at all that I that I do videos and podcasts about. Them. But I'm interested in them. And I love that interest. And I'm not, I'm not afraid to hide it. Like it doesn't hurt those companies, the fact that I have a bunch of YouTube videos where I'm talking with my friends about Bitcoin. That's just me being curious and interested, and that's not my – I don't get paid for it or anything. It's just like a fun thing. But doing that over the years and being really, really curious about this and more and more curious especially about nano payments and the ability of really tiny payments, what they can open up, I just keep thinking. And I'm just thinking out loud. I'm just sharing these thoughts, and I keep thinking like where are the business opportunities here? There's got to be some cool stuff that can be built. And so I'll go talk with developers. I'll go like I want to talk to anybody that's smart. A lot of those conversations I'm doing as podcasts, I'm sharing publicly – and it's sort of like things sort of like coalesce and come together. And so it's like, well, I might as well like sort of, you know, I've, I've really come down to focusing on this tiny payments component of cryptocurrencies being the most interesting to me. So let me just do a whole series where I'm just openly exploring this. Like, why do I think tiny payments are a big deal? Who else thinks they're a big deal? What can be done with them? What is being done with them? Let's talk. Let's look at it. And it sort of attracts other inter- talented people to you when you're loud about things and, and, and they say, Hey, I see you're doing this. I'm working on this. And so, you know, I've, I've working with some developers on some things that like, Hey, maybe if we got a bunch of people who are interested in tiny payments that are kind of part of this little community who are kind of watching these videos, uh, subscribe to the sub stack and just kind of following along as we're going through this. Maybe then if we, if we have ideas for products, we can say, Hey, try out this product. Hey, is this helpful to you? Hey, what works here? Um, so it's kind of, you know, I've got some ideas and some little side projects that we're tinkering with in the background, but it's more of a unless and until the big idea is there for a concrete product or company, why wait until then? I'm interested in this space. And no matter what, I'm not losing anything by having these conversations and, and setting up a little, you know, community with the sub stack and whatever. Um, I might as well do it. And then it increases the odds that I will have some successful idea or something that is worth building and, and you know, rolling out. Um, so that's kind of it. It's like find the market, start talking about talking to that market, talking about the interesting things in that market, you know, create, create interest and, in, and in a network of people who are, who are similarly interested before you even have a business idea or a product idea, like there's no need to wait, um, and I think it just it just like, increases again. It increases the increases your optionality and increases the odds you succeed at something. So that's kind of that's kind of the whole thing there. And it's like I'm seeing this sort of like community building through content and learning out loud, curiosity, and having companies be market first before, instead of product first. And I learned the hard way. Like it's all kind of melding in these various ways. Um, so and, and, and nano pay is part of that. Awesome. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing what comes out of that. If, if anything does, which I'm, I'm, I'm sure it will. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're tinkering, getting to we're the end of our, our what, stuff. Oh, that's great. You know, we're getting to, towards the end of our time here together. Is there anything that we've talked about or anything that you want to help promote this idea or encourage people to actually get out there and do or is there anything that we haven't hit on that you were hoping to hit on before we leave? Man, you know, in terms of just encouraging people, and I, I say this as an exhortation to myself as well, I, I try to every day. Um, 
you can feel like being online, for lack of a better phrase, is this thing that like will destroy you. Or, or you'll experience the negative effects of being too plugged in. All these current events, all this horrible propaganda and bullshit happening on Twitter and whatever else. And you can be like, okay, this stuff sucks. I got to, like, not be online anymore, right? So you can feel like you either get sucked in all the way and become really negative and jaded and you're just, like, an angry Redditor. Uh, or you're like, I got to unplug completely. <laughs> and, and I think, like, if you can constantly white pill yourself and be like look yeah there's tons of bullshit who cares I'm going to ignore all that I'm not going to pay attention to any of the bullshit I'm not going to do anything that makes me angry like if I'm just getting angry all the time that's not good but I'm not going to throw away there's something really cool that we're experiencing in the world the fact that there's this constant stream of interesting ideas going around and, and you can go tap into it on Twitter or whatever else that we can do this podcast like, like that's actually really cool I don't want to be afraid of that I don't want to be so incapable of controlling myself that I have to be all or nothing, right? So if something's not serving you, like cut it off, right? Like turn it off. Log off of a social media platform where all you ever do is get dark and negative when you're there. But try to find the productive, the creative. Like you said, if you can switch from being a consumer to being a creator, half of that mindset goes away immediately. Like when you're just a consumer, then you become a critic. And then a critic is one step removed from a cynic. And then a cynic is one step removed from like a psychopath, right? Like if you're on time, <laughs> online all the time, so you're just consuming, consuming, and then you're critiquing what you consume and then you're getting really cynical about what you consume. And then you, and it's like this spiral. If you create more than you consume, almost all that goes away. If you start the day and say, okay, I'm not going to be a not online person. I'm not going to go move to Walden Pond. But I'm going to write a blog post first thing every day. That's the first thing I'm going to do. I'm not going to get on Twitter. I'm not going to read my email. I'm going to create something. I'm going to write it. I'm going to publish it. I'm going to, I'm going to record a podcast first thing that I do every day or once a week or whatever. And I'm going to create it and I'm going to put it out there. Now you're in this positive creative mode. Now when you go engage with the world online, it's actually kind of fun and it's kind of interesting. And you kind of you're less critical too because you know you've put out stuff that's not that great so you're not going to sit there with your arms folded and be like I thought that blog post was terrible you're like yeah I've written terrible blog posts too but I, but I'm doing it right I'm writing we're all just trying stuff and it's like getting that so that's what I would say like don't reject the world of online discourse and all this kind of stuff just because it can destroy you don't let it destroy you either and one of the best ways is to create first consume later create more than you consume. In fact, you can go so far as to only create and never consume. I mean, I have had phases where I've said, I am only going to post tweets and I'm not going to read any tweets at all. And I'm not going to read comments on my tweets or notifications or engage with them. I'm only going to use Twitter to post to create stuff for a while because I'm just getting too sucked in to mindlessly consuming or getting in the comments. And there are times where I've, I've done that or I'm not even going to go on any social media. I'm only going to go and do my daily blog post on my personal blog. And that's it. Just blog every day, right? And it kind of gets you back into that frame of mind where you're in control. You're being creative. You're utilizing these digital tools in a way that's empowering and not disempowering. So I guess I would leave you with that. Oh, I love that. Isaac, it's been great talking with you today. Thanks so much for coming on the call with me. Yeah, man. Keep up the great work, Aaron. Absolutely love what you're doing. <laughs>